turn to 2 Corinthians, and then 2 Corinthians, start there, 2 Corinthians 12, I know that for sure, and then I'm going to look at something very quickly in Psalm 19. 2 Corinthians 12, Psalm 19. I had one of those goofy dreams last night. You have a goofy dream every now and then. You show up right in the middle of something. And um, last night I showed up in the middle of a cruise trip. And we actually were, had left the ship on one of these Caribbean islands. And I reached around and I felt, and I had my gun on. And I told Lisa, I said, Lisa... I've got my gun with me. That's like illegal, you know, everywhere. And I'm trying to reconcile, I'm trying to remember, number one, how I got on this cruise ship, and then how I ended up with my gun on this Caribbean island. Because, like, you got to go through airport security, ship security, island security. And then I'm thinking, how am I going to get back on the ship on the plane, back home with this gun. And I'm going, I'm going to have to ditch it in the ocean. That's all there is to it. I'm going to have to throw it in the ocean. And then Sister Pam showed me her mandolin. Now, I have no idea how that came into it. She had this real nice Turkish mandolin. I no idea. Don't even, yeah, don't even... I, need a, I guess I need a psychotherapist to sit down and analyze that dream for me, but I'd be afraid of what I'd find out. So, Yeah, it must be why I have a sour stomach, that cruise ship food. Psalm, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul was talking about the third heaven, and I'm not going to read that this morning, but uh, Psalm 19 gives you the reality of the creation. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage, and I love it. And I ponder it a lot, because as some of you know, I'm a, I love to watch the sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds. Uh, I love, I like living outside of city limits. When you live outside of city limits, you can see a lot more stars than the people inside city limits can. And it has to do with the lights, night lights, you know, reflecting off of atmospheric dirt. Um, and when you're way out in the country somewhere, or out in the desert somewhere, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, it looks like the stars are about 6 feet from your face. And you can just reach out and grab any one of them you want. It's just that clear. And um, so I've always loved astronomy, not necessarily astrology, astronomy is just studying the stars, studying the, and it's God's creation, God's word, God is the one to put them up there, and he, he lays them up there for the seasons, we gauge our seasons, we gauge our, our measurement of time by these stellar bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and um, Psalm 19, the first few verses is what I'm going to read, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. If you, if you ever see, if you ever like to look at a sunset or a sunrise, um, that is God's handiwork. There isn't an artist in the world that can paint that kind of picture, and, and with the depth that's in it. Um, if you've ever seen... If you ever looked at the stars, if you've ever seen the motions of the stars, if you've, ever, if you've ever observed the motions of the planets, if you've ever looked at uh, some of the pictures returned back to us from telescopes, uh, the galaxies and, and things like that, I love studying that stuff. To me, it declares, it shows the handiwork of God. It shows just how big God is and what He can do. And then I've pondered this for a long time because I've always wanted to know what this meant. Where it says, day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night 
showeth knowledge, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And I just, I've wondered about that passage for years. And, and just for a minute, I'm going to open it up to you and ask you what your insight is on uh, verse 2 and 3 of Psalm 19. Day day, it's talking about the heavens. And day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech in her language, or their voice is not heard. So in other words, these heavenly bodies are speaking. What, what is it that they're speaking? What is it that they're telling? How is it that everybody in the earth can hear their voice? What is that? What does that mean to you? Anybody got a clue? And I, I would say there's probably very few wrong answers. Except for the one Aaron's going to come up with, right? No, go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. Okay. We have, um, we have radio telescopes and radio dishes that are pointing to the stars because we can detect radio frequencies coming from them. Frequencies are waves, and sound goes in waves. And so it is, it is now common knowledge that every object in the sky emits a sound, a pulse of some kind. And each one is different and unique from the others. Yes? I believe that. Um, anybody else? Got a theory on this? Turn to Luke chapter 2. Here's, here's my, uh, my theory on it. Luke chapter 2. Verse 8. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. What are they doing? Praising God and saying. Notice back in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language or their voice is not heard. If you look back in Luke chapter 2, we have the heavenly host praising God and saying. What is it that they're saying? Glory to God. The heavens tell the glory of God. And these angels, the heavenly host, the stars, are saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so from what I can see, part of understanding Psalm 19 is you see a fulfillment here in Luke chapter 2 where you have the heavens, which stars are in the heavens, angels are in the heavens, and they're proclaiming the glory of God, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And in this particular case, if you go back to Psalm 19, verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth. Their line, meaning their words, their, the line, uh, the sentence that they're saying, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for who? The Son. And the Son, verse 5, is who? The bridegroom, and that's Jesus. So he said, um, he, in them, the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the Son, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So, the, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, 
Everything went from east to west. When the entrance of the tabernacle was in the east, the high priest would enter the tabernacle, he'd enter into the most holy or the holy place, the sanctuary, and then into the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was in the west. So he'd go from east to west. The sun goes from east across the sky to the west, and it's just like the heavens, it's just like the sun, and it's just like Christ who is being the one being proclaimed here in Luke chapter 2. So, to me, there's got to be more to something. To me, there's always more to it. And, I, and if I ever get done knowing everything I'm going to know in the Bible, that's the day I'm going to die. Or that's the day I hope I die. Because if God is done showing me things, what's the purpose, you know? So I don't ever want to, I don't want to ever stop knowing and stop learning from God's Word. Amen? Which is why I continue to teach Sunday school, because in teaching Sunday school, in teaching the things I teach, I want to, that makes me want to learn more and know more. And so I don't ever, ever, ever want to stop. But there's, to me, there's got to be a broader, more deeper understanding of how the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Um, and I, I have a bunch of notes on this. I may put it together and make a video on it. It'd be pretty cool. But then if people would accuse, that I've already done some of this, people have accused me of being of an, an astrologer because I talk about the summer solstice, the winter solstice, how the sun rises south to north to south again. And because you say winter solstice, that automatically makes you a magician. Okay? And I'm, yeah, I'm practicing occult arts. And I'm going, no, wait a minute. God is the one who made that. God is the one who put the sun where it is and put all the stars where they are. And he's the one that gives them all a name. And he's the one that gave us the days, right? Why is June 21st longer than December 21st? That wasn't Satan that did that. It was God, so anyway. All right, 2 Corinthians 12, turn there. Um, I'm not going to talk about this this morning. In fact, I'm probably going to take a vacation from it for a while. But I did an interview um, last Wednesday with a man that follows our ministry, and he was caught up in the flat earth movement, and um, he, God brought him out of it, and I broadcast his testimony Thursday, and in anticipation that he would be attacked, and I was not prepared for the depth that these people would sink to, to nail this guy. They are pulling out all the stops, and um, they're accusing him of bad things. Okay? Now, someone would say, so what if some of them are true? So what? Raise your hand if you've got a past. Now, raise your hand if you want that exposed in front of everybody. Okay? Nobody does. But... And I appreciate his spirit because he said, I'm going to deal with this head on. I'm not going to run from it. And I feel bad for even doing the interview uh, because they have just, they're just accusing him of terrible things. And, um, but it, that's the tactics of people who don't have the substance of what they believe in. Okay? When you can't answer the issue, attack the messenger. And that's what they're doing. Because they think then, if they can get everybody to think that this guy is a really bad person, then they don't have to listen to him, and then he's wrong on everything. Well, let me help everybody with that. Everybody I know is a really bad person. Everybody I know here at church is a really bad person. Everybody, everybody that knows me knows me I'm a really bad person. Okay, but that can't stop us from telling the truth. Amen? Amen? Can't, don't let the devil tie you up with fear 
about what he's going to expose about you. Don't let the devil do that, because if you do, he'll tie you up in knots, and you'll never say a word about Jesus. And um, people just people need to hear the truth. They need to hear the gospel. Amen? And uh, so the devil likes to remind us of our past, and I like the statement that says, remind him of his future. Because your past is nowhere near where he's headed. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, speaking of your past. Uh, in, in, when Paul is dealing with this issue of seeing the third heavens, or the man that he said who saw the third heavens, the third heaven, and saw those sayings and heard those words that are unspeakable, um, there are those who like to brag about such events. There's a show called uh, It's Supernatural with a man who is a, he's a Jewish quote-unquote Christian, but um, he is all about interviewing people who have had these big experiences with God. Some claiming that they were allowed to go to heaven and view heaven's library. Some saying that they have a secret language between them and God. Some saying that God speaks to them directly and they, they, God tells them to write these things down that God says to them. Um, and all of these people love to boast and brag about their spiritual experiences as if they are the, the holy ones that God selected. They are the special ones that God selected and God didn't select anybody else. So that must mean that they're very special and they like to be exalted because of their quote-unquote revelations. And that's really what that stuff is all about. Nine times out of ten, I suspect that they're making this stuff up, uh, but even if they're not, even if they're experiencing something, that in itself is a setup for a big lie. But the idea is, is that people exalt those who say, well, I died, and God allowed me to spend you know, uh, 23 hours in hell, and I experienced hell, and then God let me out of hell so, he could, so I could come back and write a book about it. No, I'm sorry, there's already a book written about hell. It's called the Bible. Everything I need to know about hell is right now. I don't, I don't doubt anything in this Bible. I doubt, seriously, somebody said, I went to hell and God allowed me to come back. I don't go for that stuff. After, after death experiences or near-death experiences, they boast about these things as if they're the special ones that God allowed to see these things. And now they've come back and God wants them to tell the world. When you read 2 Corinthians 12, Paul's got that covered because Paul says, if I was that guy, there's no way in the world I would be allowed to glory in the revelations that was given me. So I'm not going to glory in that. I'm not even going to talk about it much. What I'm going to glory in is mine infirmities. I'm going to glory in the things that really is common amongst everybody. Everybody's got ailments. Everybody has infirmities. Everybody has problems. Everybody has issues. Paul said that's where my glory is going to be because when I am weak and when I'm nothing, that's when God is everything. And what happens is people have experiences and those experiences that they say are with God they, they really feel like and believe that that makes them unique above everybody else and sort of like belittles God and belittles everybody else, but it glorifies and magnifies them. And I'm just, I don't like being around people. I do not like being around people who think they're better than me. And as soon as I catch on that, that, that I'm in that crowd, I'm out. I just don't deal well with it. Uh, there's another thing that some psychologists would have a field day with my childhood, but I just don't like people who think they're better than everybody else. I don't, I used to cater to that and I, I, cause I'd want to be in with them and God's brought me out of that stuff. So now we're going to look at what makes us all special with God. And that is the uniqueness and yet the, the commonality of all of our thorns. And we're going to study what that is. So in, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Let me stop right here. 
When Paul was met on the road to Damascus, remember he was on his way to kill Christians. Uh, he hated them. And on that road, Jesus himself physically appeared to Paul. It blinded him. And um, so Paul spent several days blind. Then the scales came off of his eyes. He was baptized there in Damascus. And then the, Paul says in Galatians that rather than conferring with the other apostles and learning the doctrines from like Peter or John or James, Paul says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. So we know, according to what Paul said, for 14 years, the Apostle Paul was visited by Jesus Christ himself and given revelations, given the doctrines. Now, Paul had the Old Testament with him. And he would, undoubtedly, he would read the Old Testament. He would read part of the passages of Scripture. And then the Holy Spirit would give him insight into what that meant, how that related to Christ. So there really isn't a lot in the Old Testament that Paul doesn't cover with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Whether it's the law of sacrifices, uh, that's covered at the cross. And Paul was shown those things. Any place in the Old Testament that was a secret, those things were revealed to the Apostle Paul. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, the story of Samson and Samson's birth. We have a man by the name of Manoah and his wife, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and says, I'm going to give you a child. It's sort of like a prefiguring of the angel appearing to Mary, saying you're going to have, you're going to have the Christ. And so when Manoah shows up, um, his wife tells him what happened. The angel comes and says it to Manoah. Manoah wants to know this angel's name. And the angel says, I can't tell you my name, seeing it is a secret. Well, I believe that that angel of the Lord was in fact the Lord himself, Jesus himself. And he cannot reveal himself as Jesus to anybody in the Old Testament. It's a secret. But when we look back, knowing the New Testament, when we look back and read it, we can go, ah, I know who that is. Okay, because there's a lot to the story. But anyway, we know who that is. We know who the angel of the Lord is. We know who the, the lamb is. We know who the high priest is. We know what the blood is about. We know what Passover is about. We know what the rock was that Moses struck where the water came out. We know what the manna was that came down and fed them. We know all of these things now because they were first revealed to Paul. So he spent 14 years learning these things by the Holy Ghost through the scriptures, so now 14, Paul's got, how long does it take to get a, a doctorate? Does anybody know? You go four years to get your bachelor's degree, two more years to get a master's degree, two to three more years to get a doctor's degree, right? No matter what field it's in, you're talking minimum eight years. Well, Paul almost doubled that. He's 14 years getting his super doctorate doctorate but he's getting it directly from God himself, not from another man. And he's very keen to point that out. I did not confer with flesh and blood. He said, I got these things from God himself. Now, Paul's nature, and this is why God selected him. Paul's nature is he's very arrogant and very prideful. He's got a lot of zeal in what he does. We see that throughout his Christian ministry. He doesn't like anybody to slow him down. When he's going to go kill Christians, I don't, want to, I don't want to be delayed in doing this. I want to do it quick. Then he's got a lot of zeal as far as preaching the gospel and making Christians. Doesn't want anybody to slow him down. But we also know the side of Paul that's very arrogant and very full of pride because he, he displays that when he's talking about how if anybody could glory in the flesh, that could be me. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I was a zealot. Concerning the law, I was spotless. If anybody could boast about who they were, Paul said that would have been me. So think about this. God took the one person 
who upon receiving these revelations would have, would have said, I'm the Pope. Right? And probably with most men could have got away with it. And God said, now, now that I've shown you all these things, I'm going to let a messenger of Satan buffet you every day of your life. So that you're never, Paul, you're never, ever, ever going to exalt yourself. And you're never going to let anybody else exalt you either. You're not going to let that happen. That's why God picked Saul of Tarsus. That's why he picked him. That's why he gave him what he gave him. He gave him far more then any, I mean, here you have Peter and John and James who actually traveled with Jesus and was taught by Jesus, watched him die, watched him rise from the dead, and yet Peter gets to write two books out of the New Testament, John gets to write five, James one. Paul is not a partaker with those guys in any of that. He writes 14 books out of the New Testament. The majority, the overwhelming majority of New Testament books written by the Apostle Paul. And Paul could have exalted himself above everybody else for that very reason. But God wouldn't let him because of the thorn. That thorn, it always has a purpose. It always has, a re there's a reason why God has not delivered you from your thorn or your thorns. There's a reason why. There's a reason why that he won't. Until such a time as God thinks that you can handle what he's given you, he's not going to let you be exalted above anybody else or above him. Because that's what our wicked nature does you give it, listen, you give us a new penny when we're five years old, we're showing everybody in class, hey, look what I got, right? Look what I got. I mean, when I was in elementary school, Christmas time, once we all came back from Christmas break, all the kids were bringing their toys that they got for Christmas. And I'm going, how come my parents don't love me like their parents love them? Because they're all bragging about what all they got and all the stuff that they had, and it wasn't near as good as what anybody else had. Yeah, that game's played by children in a schoolyard, but it's also played by a lot of adults, too. And God hates it. He hates it. I'll tell you how bad Jesus hates it. Uh, I'm probably not going to just throw a dart and find this without looking, but in Revelation... Revelation uh, chapter 2, I believe. Jesus, you probably find it before I will. Jesus spoke of, on two different occasions, the doctrine and the works. Of the, here it is in verse, chapter 2, verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot of writing by scholars about what the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans are, but here's what I think. Nico is a word that means conquer. Okay, it means like a king. Um, the laetane are the people who are sitting in the church pews. And the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, from what I can see, is the idea that the clergy is special above the church members. That the clergy people, because God selected them to be the priest and the prophets and the holy men, because God selected them, that they are a league above everybody else. And any time, and I don't care what religion it is, that, that doctrine is in practically every religion in the world where the imam or the witch doctor or the holy man or the priest or the evangelist or whoever, the pope, is way above everybody else, okay? And um, you all right there? 
All right. But anyway, it's the idea that they're above everybody else simply because God selected them or God picked them or God called them. And Jesus said, I hate it. I hate their deeds and I hate that doctrine. And so I think it's best when a pastor, bishop of a church, is at least the same as the people that he is pastor over. At least the same. On the same level, same weaknesses, same strivings, uh, same frailties, same sins, same everything. I think it's best that it be that way, but we have two things working against this. Number one, we have a lot of men in the ministry who do think that they're better than other people because they're in the ministry, and number two... We have a lot of people in pews who exalt their leaders as being better than everybody else simply because they're the leaders. And when you have those two things working against what Jesus said, there's almost no chance that God's going to be able to do anything in that church. Because you have the men who say that they're better and exalted, and then you have the people that exalt them. You have, man, I could give a lot of names. But in every, even in independent, fundamental, King James-only movements, the guys who are the loudest mouths about the King James Bible, they're the exalted ones, and how dare anybody question them? They can't, because they're right about this one thing, it's, it's almost like they can't be wrong about anything else in the world. And I sort of grew up in that environment where you have these names that they're above, they're above everybody else, and whatever they say, well, then we can't question that because they're God's man. And, and I just, I don't know, I used to be that way, and I just come out of that stuff. I, God's kind of made me realize that if they're in the ministry, they're probably just as rotten and sour as I am. Or God didn't call them. So anyway, it, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the reason for Paul's thorn is specifically because he doesn't want and God doesn't want him exalted above anybody else. Now, because of that, there were always people who railed on Paul, accused him of things, spoke little of him or... Uh, tried to belittle him in front of people. Did you hear what Paul said? Did you hear what kind of person Paul, what, what, what kind of apostle, what kind of man of God is he? He can't even see. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of leader is that? The guy can't even see what's wrong with him. And because of Paul's weaknesses, there was naturally going to be people who were going to be accusing him of stuff all the time. When I first started putting stuff on the internet, I guess I was naive enough to think that most everybody would like it. And then I found out that there were people who would try to pick me apart. And if I would watch their videos, I'd be going, well, that's not true. That's, I don't believe that, or I didn't say that, or I'm not like that. And then I'd want to go after them. And I, after a while, I remembered when David was exiled from his own throne by his own son, Absalom. You remember that story? Absalom had, him, had David on the run. There was a man that met up with David, and as soon as he saw him, he started picking up rocks, throwing them at David, and cursing at him, calling him names. David's right-hand soldier man, can't remember who it was, had his spear in his hand and said, David, you tell me, you tell me go, and I'll, I'll cut his head off for you. How dare he speak against the king? I think it was Joab, and Joab said, David, I'll cut his head off. As soon as you, as soon as you say go, I'll cut his head off, I won't even think about it. And David said this, he said, no, don't. Because who's to say that God didn't send him here to say those things about me? And uh, Maybe I needed to hear that. David, by this time, had already committed his sin with Bathsheba, having had her husband killed to cover up the pregnancy. And David's, even though he's forgiven, David understands the sword's not going to, the very reason for Absalom 
trying to take over his father's throne was because of that sin. He was told the sword's never going to depart from your house, David. There's always going to be fighting going on. And here it was, the son against the father. And so David said, no, leave him alone. Let him, do what, let him say what he's going to say. Let him do what he's going to do. And since that time, people have pointed out to me things that people have said about me on the internet, videos that people have made, blogs that people have put up, or they have shared with me the rumors that people have told. Uh, the guy I just interviewed Wednesday, he had others telling him, bear watch out for that Mike Hoggard, bear stay away from him. And I didn't even bother, you know, part of me wanted to go, what did they say? What did they say about me, huh? But I just let it go. And uh, because it's not good for anybody to have everybody say nice things about them all the time. That's not good for anybody. If everybody's patting you on the back constantly, telling you how good you are and what a good person you are and how great and how heroic you are and how smart you are and how wise you are, our head gets about that big, and we are no good to anybody. We're a danger to ourselves and others at that point. And so I learned to just leave people be. Let them say what they want to about me. Let them judge me if they want to. If I have a conscience, my conscience is either going to agree with them, and there ain't a thing I can do about it, or my conscience is going to say, you know what, you can say what you want. I know the truth. And ultimately, what matters is what a thrice holy God thinks and says about me. What matters to me the most is whether or not I am in God's favor or not. And if I'm in God's favor then there isn't a thing in the world that any man can do or say against me. If I'm not in God's favor, I can have everybody in the world in my corner. And I'm going to suffer eternity in the lake of fire. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, watch yourself on social media. I'm going to say this to everybody. You can handpick the, the right amount of people that whatever nonsense you come up with on the internet, everybody's going to say, oh, that was great. Oh, man, you're brilliant. Oh, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. You're always going to find people who tell you what you want to hear. And um, that's not good for you. Me running home to my mom saying they're picking on me or running to my sister saying they're picking on me. My mom at one point realized that it wasn't good for her son to have someone protect him all the time so that nobody ever said anything bad about her child. Let me tell you something. If you're raising a child, constantly protecting them from every harmful thing, you're going to destroy that child's life one of these days by doing that. There's more harm done that way than in what you think somebody else might do to your child. My mom was wise enough to figure that out. And my, finally, my mom said, well, if you're sick of it, go punch him in the nose. Okay? Well, that's not what I wanted to hear. And ultimately, that's not what I did either. I didn't go punch anybody in the nose, but... But what I'm saying is, God is wise enough, He's going to leave you with just enough enemies, spiritual and physical, so that you keep running back to God, saying, God, what they're saying about me is not true, and of course God says, I know, and you know. Or, you'll run to God and say, God, what they said about me is true. And I don't have any place else to go except you. So let me read this for I know the bell rung, but anyway, he said, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
So look at it this way. Yes, there is an entire angelic army at your disposal, ready to protect you, ready to circle you, compass you, ready to watch over you and to take care of you. But there is also at least one, if not multiple devils, that are the reason why you need protected to begin with. And God's not going to take them away. How many times did Paul ask God to remove this thorn? Thrice, three times. Why that number? Why didn't, God, why didn't Paul say, I asked God a bunch of times, or oftentimes I asked God. Why, did God? why did Paul make it specifically three times? There's a reason why. But the idea is, is that it's not good for us to not have thorns in our flesh. It's not good for us here to be exalted too highly. That's not good for us. We need to be brought down back to ground level sometimes. Amen? The greatest days that you'll experience in the Lord, right after that, God's going to let you come down sometimes to the biggest fall you've ever had. Just to keep your life where it needs to be.